you have the power to engage with the world in a new way, in a new way that brings hope. So what are you going to do? When you look at another person, can you say, what wondrous thing does this person need? What one thing could make their life better? What words could you share that would give hope to others? And we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week. But spiritual truth is that if you want love, you have to give love. The thing that you want the most is the thing that you have to give. So you want trust? You want to be seen as trustworthy? Then give trust to other people. You want hope? Give others hope. That's what we're doing here. We are so connected. What happens to my brother and my sister happens to me. What joyous things happen to them happens to me. What sadness happens to them happens to me because we're connected. That song was absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Wicked, the Broadway show, is my number one. Hamilton's my number two. And every time I hear that song, I cry. So it's just beautiful. Beautiful rendition. Thank you. So imagine, just because I knew you, I've been changed for good. That's the work that we're doing here, my friends. That's the work that we're doing here. Just because of that connection, we are changed for the better. This is why we do the work. This is why we've been spending this time looking at what tools can we use to make that connection with each other palpable. Make it the truth, which is there is only oneness. How do we do that? So we've been spending time in this season of radical renewal. What have we been doing? We've been exploring how to be present with each other, how to be present with each other in kindness and awakened ways. If you can tell, this is, this is deep to my heart, right? So we've been discovering the language of the giraffe which enables us to finally get in touch with our own feelings. And then, like, there are needs that, are, that we have. You know, I don't know about you, but I never learned that it was acceptable to ask for what I needed. You know, growing up, it was like, you're just too much. You're always asking for something, you know? It's like, the sky's the limit with you. Well, we don't have the sky money, right? So I never learned how to ask for things, and I never learned that it was okay. And guess what? Normal. Humans have needs. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> Go figure. And so what we do is we hide all of those desires for our needs, right, in these crazy ways because we don't want to just say, you know, today I really need love and appreciation from you. Wow. So we are using NVC. We're using NVC as a tool that supports us in honoring truth. What is truth? There is only oneness. Each of us is a part of God, and we are simply awakening to the knowing of our divinity. That's it. So I've been asking you to practice this kindness languaging, right? And last week, I specifically asked you to be kind with yourself as you feel these feelings, like all emotions are of God right, whether they're the light and fluffy ones that we like to live in or the denser ones that let us know that there is a need that we have that we have to get met. Not somebody else meeting it for us, but that we have to meet. So the reason we're doing this work, yes, to be changed by each other for good, but our goal is to be resurrected as the Christ. That's our spiritual goal. So, how was this week for you? Mm, I'm not here. I'm not, mm, not, what? Good? Challenging. I like that. What was challenging? 
Ooh, to sit with the difficult pieces. We're so used to being re like something comes at us, we're like, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. And now when we're doing this language, it's about, ooh, breathing and pausing and going, ooh, isn't that interesting, right? Observing, ooh, isn't that interesting, right? Before we snark someone. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> what else? What else did you have going on this week? Frank was the only one in class this last week. <clears throat> okay, Paula, what do you got there? Ooh, you bought Cindy's print. Ooh. Thank you, Paula. Paula's in our class and she's really enjoying it and she's like getting in there and going like, what if this person comes at you like this? How do you respond, right? How do you respond and not react? So this is an exciting time. Were you able to be kind to yourself no matter what emotions came up for you this week? Yes, better? Good, it only has to be better or eh, not so much is okay too. But it's, it's a journey, it's not a destination. Like we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfect. We're going to be imperfect and we're learning and we're taking our time with it. So thank you for those of you who shared back with me. I really appreciate that. So what have we been doing? These past few weeks, we've been looking at several components of NVC, right? We looked at observe. Oh, look at those things didn't line up perfectly on this, but that's okay. You can read, right? Observe. Oh, there's the E. Okay. <laughs> it looked perfect at home when I did it. Um, so when we do observing, right, we're, tr sorry? It is perfect. Per Thank you, Opal. It is perfect. That's right. Woohoo, woohoo. Yes. So we're looking at observing, right? Getting into that place of neutrality where it's, as I mentioned, ooh, look at that. Huh, I didn't see that before. Oh, that's an interesting discovery, right? So that neutrality. And then we talked about feelings and whose responsibility are feelings? That's right, our own. My feelings, my responsibility. And then we talked about needing, right? That we all have needs and we have learned some unhealthy ways of getting those needs met because we never gave ourselves permission to have needs and to meet those needs. And now, all of that together, those three, what they do for us is they build our level of self-awareness. So we become a little bit more in touch with our emotions, our feelings, how we operate in the world, all of that, and it gave us a way to start expressing those things, right? And that's really helpful. And then the next component that we're gonna delve into the next couple of weeks is empathy. Notice the phrase there, a divine experience. That's the reframing that we're gonna be using over the next couple of weeks when we look at empathy. Now I know most of you understand empathy as the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And most of us feel pretty confident that we've got a good skill set on being empathic with each other, right? And that we're able to practice it with ease. <laughs> Frank, don't steal my thunder, I see you there. <laughs> and yet most of the time when someone's talking, what are we doing? We're in our head, right? We're in our head and we're thinking, ooh, I got a really good comeback for that one. Ooh, yeah, maybe they don't know that. Ooh, yeah, right? And even if our response or our desire is altruistic, like we want to let them know they're not alone, right? Or we want to share our vast enlightened wisdom with them. <laughs> <laughs> or we want to fix them because somehow we've gone into evaluation and discern that mm, there's something wrong with you that needs fixing and I'm gonna help fix you. I'm sure it's just me who's done those things. Okay, all right, you guys are way above me, thank you. So, um, and you know, here's the thing, it happens a lot in spiritual communities as well. 
you know? It's like we get impassioned and fired up and we're like, you can have what I have, now let me tell you how to do it, right? And we kind of hijack them a little bit from their path and their process. So, in his book, Marshall Rosenberg talks about different behaviors that are empathy barriers. And as I go through these, you know, just kind of go check, check if you kind of resonate in that category, you know? I'm not asking you for the total at the end of the conversation. So advising people, right? That's an empathy barrier. You know, you should just do blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. What about the one-upping? Oh, that's nothing. You should have seen when I did blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Educating, and this is a phrase that we use a lot in Unity, my friends. Well, perhaps, you know, it's just all good. It's in divine order. And we may know that, but is that helpful to get someone to feel empathic, that we are caring about them? Hmm. And then there's the consoling. Oh, honey, it's not your fault, right? I see heads dropping now. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> no judgment. Then we got the storytelling, right? Someone tells you something and then you remember a time when, and then you go off on your whole like story about it, and they're left like, okay, well, I really kind of wanted to talk about what was going on with me with this, but all right. And then we have the shutting down. You know, somebody's like really emotional. We're like, dude, it's not that big a deal, right? Or sympathizing, you poor thing. I use this a lot. I use this a lot. And I do it because sometimes when I'm in counseling, people haven't been given permission to feel what they feel, you know? And then we have the questioning, the interrogator. So when did this happen? Who was there? And, how did it, and what was the tone that they used when they said what they said, right? <laughs> and then we've got the explaining. I would have done this, or I, you know, those kind of messaging, and then the correcting. Dude, you got it wrong. Or it didn't go down that way, right? So all of those are barriers that we have when we're conversing with others um, that stops us from having that empathic connection. So if you looked at that list, don't feel concerned because, of course, some of your responses fall into those categories. That's how we've been taught, right? But what this is now is it's about bringing our awareness up, like, oh, I see that now. I see that that could be perceived as a barrier. So here's a simple tip to shift. If your response is intellectual, you're creating separation. You're not creating connection. Does that make sense? So if we're in our heart, that's why we talked to you about doing that heart breathing in and through the heart chakra to open that up. So that's the frequency that you're moving in with others because that's how you're going to get that connection. When you're up here, intellect is separation. Good tip? Yes. Okay. All right, so I want you to look at empathy from a new light. Empathy as it being a divine experience. And here's what Rosenberg says about that. Empathy with others occurs only when we have successfully shed all preconceived ideas and judgments about them. That's a tall order. So I want you to just close your eyes for a minute if you're comfortable. And I want you to imagine that you got an invitation to a party. And it's a friend that invited you, but it's kind of like another friend's party that they invited you to, and you said yes, and you're going. And you walk in and you realize you don't know anyone. No one's there. Perhaps you may feel a little uncomfortable. You're going in. You're wondering, are they judging me? Are they labeling me based on my clothes I'm wearing? Did I dress up too much? Did I dress down? Is it too sexy? Is it too boring? What about my hair? What about the skin color that I have? What about my gender? Are they labeling me and putting me in a box before they've even 
heard my voice. And then, to your surprise, you meet someone. You meet someone who listens to you, who doesn't have an agenda, who isn't being clever, who doesn't have anything to prove. They just want to get to know you. And after speaking with that person, you feel this kind of release of tension and a sense of contentment. You have that feeling? That's what it feels like when you receive empathy. Do you hear that? That's what it feels like when you receive empathy. So that's why I wanted you to go through that exercise so you could have that sense of, oh, contentment. Oh, nothing to prove. No up, no down, just equal. So, if that was your interaction with everyone you meet, how would it feel for you? Great. Great. Good. Yep. I got two thumbs up. Yes. I don't know about you, but there have been times where I avoid being around people. I can, I can label it and say, I'm an introvert, so therefore, you know, you know how that is. But the reality is, there are moments where I'm terrified of what violent words are going to come flying at me, you know? But if we are in this place of oneness, if we are in this place of really understanding that every person is an aspect of us in one way or another, then when we are connecting the only expression that can exist between us is divinity. <sighs> That's why I think empathy is a pathway to renewing hope in our society. Empathy, renewing hope. And Rosenberg affirms this when he says, isn't that a great picture? I just saw that and I was just like, yeah, they're zoned in. That's divinity out picturing right there. So Rosenberg says this, but for me, empathy is getting with that energy that's coming through the other person. It's a divine experience. I feel as if I'm really in a flow with divine energy. When two people connect in that way, any kinds of conflict can be resolved so that everybody's needs get met. Are you starting to see why we're doing this work? Okay, good. You see, having an intellectual understanding of oneness and of God, it's worthless. Mm. Did she just say that in church? Yeah, I think she just said that in church. <laughs> having an intellectual understanding and of oneness and of God is worthless if we are not able to operate from our knowing that there is no separation. Amen? It's worthless if we look at others as lacking or monsters. So I'm going to talk about an example that's given in the New Testament. Heard about the Good Samaritan parable? Yeah? Okay, good. So this story is written in the book of Luke, and theologians suggest it's written somewhere around 60 AD, and it's written by Luke, who was a friend, a Gentile, and um, a friend of Paul, and kind of traveled around with Paul on his excursions into the Gentile lands to convert folks. But do you know what the purpose of the book of Luke is? The purpose is that it's possible for both Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles, to have salvation. That's the purpose of the book of Luke. So, how does this story come to be? So, Jesus, he's sitting with his disciples, you know, and he's kind of commissioning them to go out and spread the good news. And as he's doing that, you know, he's giving instructions. And one of the things that Jesus likes to do is to tell parables. And parables basically are just stories that have, like, a moral lesson or a spiritual understanding. And he, he does that. And during this discourse, right, a lawyer approaches under the guise that, wink, wink, I'll be a student. 
But what he's really trying to, to get there is, will Jesus speak heretically? So the lawyer comes and here's what he says. This is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 28. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then he said to him, you have answered right. Do this, and you will live. All right, that sounds good. But you know the lawyer still thinks, I can trip this guy up. I'm going to ask him this question. So who's my neighbor? And then Jesus goes into the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story is, this Jewish man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as he travels, he gets mugged. He's robbed, he's beaten, he's left on the ground on the street, broken and battered, right? And then, what happens? A Jewish priest sees him there, crosses over to the other side of the street, passes by. And then a Levite, another Jewish person, sees him there, crosses over the street, passes him by. And then, the Samaritan, sees this broken man in need of aid and helps. The Samaritan bandages his wounds, takes him to a hotel, asks the hotel, you know, the hotelier, listen, I'm traveling, can you just take care of him? Here's some money to, you know, to cover the costs. And then, you know, if it's more, go ahead, because the next time I'm heading back, you know how sales calls are, you just, you got a route, you're going to do that. So I'll be back again, and I'll just give you whatever else is needed. And so Jesus then says to the lawyer, which one of these is the neighbor? And the lawyer said, the one who had mercy. Boom, right? Mic drop. But here's the other piece. Because it's even deeper than this when we delve in, it's mind-blowing. The reason that it's mind-blowing is the Jewish people believed that they were the chosen one of God. They believed they were highly favored. Now, their laws were don't kill anyone, right? But if you kill a Jew, uh, Gentile, you're not going to be punished. Why? Because God favors us. Gentile doesn't matter. The priest, a Jewish man, a Levite who was actually the priest's assistant, so you know what those roles were. These are people that are high moral standing of the community, yes? Their roles are to be tender and compassionate to others. They profess sanctity. And they showed no mercy on their Jewish brother, the man who was in desperate need. The Samaritan, who belonged to a nation that the Jews abhorred and detested, was the one to provide assistance. The stranger, who was loathed by the Jewish people, loved and gave hope to this Jewish man. Compassion and empathy. Pfft, mind blown. And the same ethos undergirds the work that we're doing in nonviolent communication. One of the practitioners shared their awakened shift of consciousness. And I thought this was truly a powerful statement. When I concentrated on listening for their feelings and needs, I stopped seeing him as a monster. I stopped seeing him as a monster. How many monsters do you have in your life? <laughs> right? 
how many monsters do we have? Because if we have monsters in our lives, we've created those monsters. We've created those monsters. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh, well, you know, that was just like first century AD. You know, it's, that story's really not relevant to us today. But how many of us judge people who are homeless or who are addicts or who are felons as worth less? So 10 years ago, Graham and I lived in Kansas City. And we were coming off the highway and we got on the ramp and there was a traffic light at the lamp and there was this homeless person there. And Spirit nudged me to give him money. And the guy was on Graham's side, so I, I said to Graham, would you please give him this? So he rolls down his window and he's flagging the guy. Guy comes over and the guy grabs Graham's arm and does one of those bro hug kind of things. You could see it moved him, that contact with another human being. There were tears in his eyes. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. And then Graham tried to hold my hand with that same hand that touched the homeless person. <laughs> well, now. <laughs> ah, that was another moment for me because I had to look at my unconscious bias. You see, I was raised in a family that like germs and dirt were like n not allowed, you know? And I kept always hearing Cleanliness is next to godliness, right? You heard that phrase before? And this guy, let's face it, he smelled. He reeked. You know? And I had to look at that again, at my judgment, to say that someone who is in that category may not be clean, but does that mean they're not of God? that they don't deserve human contact and love. They don't deserve to be seen. And so that was a really good moment for me because I really got to look at it. And then I got to change some of my behaviors. You know, I was a neat freak at home. Everything had to just be like in a certain place. And so I was able to kind of relax that, much to Graham's relief and joy. <laughs> So what's the point here? The point is that a big part of our othering and making monsters of others starts within ourselves. It starts within ourselves. We've been conditioned to believe our purpose on this planet is to meet other people's expectations of us. Starts in our family, school, religion, jobs, and when we aren't able to be what others want us to be, we've been shamed and blamed. And then we've bought into that blame and shame. And many of us have come to believe that we aren't even worthy of God's love. And we definitely couldn't give ourselves any empathy or compassion. Here's what Rosenberg says. When we can empathize with ourselves and really stay connected to our true self in a life-enriching way, we can hear or sense which needs we're not meeting by our actions, at which point we can also see which needs we were trying to meet by doing what we just did. You see, as in all things, right, it all begins with us. If we want to feel loved by others, it's not gonna happen until we're able to love ourselves. And we say that all the time, and you're probably rolling your eyes. Yes, we've heard that before. But it really does come down to that. Until we're able to give ourselves love and compassion, we're not gonna be able to do that for others until we're able to meet our own needs and say it's acceptable and I'm worthy of having my needs met, we're not gonna be able to love and support other people either. So I guess my question to you is, what would make your life more wonderful right now? 
What would make your life more wonderful? And if you say the lotto numbers, okay, I get it and I hear you. But I'm gonna ask again, what is one realistic thing, one realistic action that you can take today that would make your life more wonderful? Sleep, that's a, that's a big one. Yes, yes, to allow ourselves to have our body like taken care of and replenished through sleep. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? More empathy. More empathy, yes, for yourself. Yes, beautiful, thank you. Anyone else? Health? Yes, to focus on taking care of ourselves, yes. Peace in your mind. What a concept. What? Peace in your own mind. Yes. That you are wondrously made of divinity. And who and what you are right now is perfectly acceptable. Ooh, that's peace. Like it. So here's the thing. Once we can know what our own needs are and how to meet those needs, we actually get filled up with empathy and compassion. It's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of meeting our needs. And I want to remind you that when you leave here on Sundays and you go out living your lives, sometimes it's really easy to lose hope. We lose hope, especially when we see the chaos that's going on in the world. But you have the power. You have the power to engage with the world in a new way, in a new way that brings hope. So what are you going to do? When you look at another person, can you say, what wondrous thing does this person need? What one thing could make their life better? What words could you share that would give hope to others? And we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week. But spiritual truth is that if you want love, you have to give love. The thing that you want the most is the thing that you have to give. So you want trust? You want to be seen as trustworthy? Then give trust to other people. You want hope? Give others hope. That's what we're doing here. We are so connected. What happens to my brother and my sister happens to me. What joyous things happen to them happens to me. What sadness happens to them happens to me because we're connected. So this week, I'm inviting you to, yes, continue practicing the giraffe language, but also to figure out one action that you can give to someone else. Maybe it's words, maybe it's compassion, maybe it's joy. Thank you.